Uh, Dr. Finley, welcome. Thank you. So Thanks. how many heart attacks are there in the UK at the moment? Yeah, well, too many, that's for sure. So about 85,000 people have to go to hospital with a heart attack every year in the UK. But when people ignore it, that's when the real trouble happens. We've got an open the artery. People are going home the next day. People really worry about doing exercise after. Exercise. So a thought, a thought can start to increase your pulse. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Finley, welcome. Thank you. So how many heart attacks are there in the UK at the moment? Yeah, well, too many, that's for sure. So about 85,000 people have to go to hospital with a heart attack every year in the UK. And does that mean there might be more than 85,000 and people don't realise it? Yeah, but I think the British Heart Foundation, to be fair, has done a great job at uh, making sure that people do recognise now the symptoms of a heart attack, chest pain, that radiating pain down the shoulder, sometimes feeling clammy and short of breath. And so people do go to the hospital in the most part when they, they experience those symptoms. Okay. So a friend of mine was in a cafe and he yep. had those symptoms. He went yep. outside, sat on the step. Yep. Um, then went next door to a news agent and right. bought himself some aspirin, right? Which he then chewed. Yes. Something in his that you is, know, brain yeah. said, "Do that." Um, was that a good so thing that to do? that advice has certainly got got through that that is a you know a recommended first step in our in if you're okay. experiencing that. Uh, but normally we would say you know seek medical attention is the is really the first thing and let the ambulance crew or the uh, the emergency medics to give you the aspirin rather than having okay. to buy it for twenty pence in a news agent. <laughs> I know when I was worked in um, the psychiatric world, the consultant I worked with had a right. heart attack, which he explained to me. And when he realised he was having one, literally in the street, he laid down on the pavement. Right. And pa a passerby said are you okay, sir? And he yeah. said, I'm fine. I'm having a heart attack and I've called the ambulance. Right. What do you think of That's, that? Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> lying down the street is one way to get a heart attack. Certainly stopping doing, uh, certainly lying down in the middle of the street is one way of getting attention to pass and by, I guess. Um, I, Quite dramatic. Yeah. You know, the, the important thing is to take it seriously straight away. So obviously he, he did that. He felt he was having a heart attack. Obviously a medical professional, he had some insight into what was going on uh, but the classic thing is to when people ignore it that's when the real trouble happens we've got great treatments for heart attacks mm. acute heart attacks uh, now uh, nowadays and it's important to think about that uh, ignoring things doesn't make it go away but if people uh, you know if you go to hospital and it turns out not to be a serious symptom well, then you've lost a few hours. If you go to hospital, mm. if you don't go to hospital and it has been something serious, well, then you could lose a whole lot more. Yeah. Yeah, my friend, I mean, this happened 10 years ago and he's as fit as a fiddle now and living life, you know, to the yeah. full. I so. mean, that, that is one of the great things about modern medical treatments, really, for heart disease. We've yeah. come so far, so people now have a great expectation, even after a serious, you know, a serious and potentially life-threatening issue people get back to really full health i mean the, the name itself is frightening isn't it it's probably the thing that maybe an exaggeration but i guess most people are really scared yeah i mean about the terminology the of these things comes from the you know, original ideas of the disease people had a sudden occlusion of one of the heart arteries making them feel very quickly a catastrophic event really and yeah. without medical treatment that can be an, an awful thing if you remember mm. back to the well you know i just remember when i was young um it was wasn't that rare for people in their 40s or 50s to have a big heart attack and die and mm. now that is something which i think really is actually mm. rare thankfully mm. so of that number eighty five thousand, how many <clears throat> difficult question i appreciate yeah. but how many in today's world could actually be prevented by I don't know, the individual taking more care of their life or, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, so there's some statistics ab about that. I think, uh, you know, because we've done so well on population prevention, that number that can be absolutely prevented probably is smaller than we'd hope. Um, so around 15 to 30%, I think, from modifiable risk factors. So stopping smoking, people losing weight, people treating high blood pressure, having diabetes well well controlled there then that's the sort of proportion that we could expect 
to reduce with today's technology. I think if we had a better screening technologies, and so we then could intervene with some medical therapies earlier and probably prevent more heart attacks. Mm. Okay, so that's at the prevention end. Then at the fix it after the event, I guess going back, you know, back in the day, whatever that means, yep. uh, having a heart attack was serious and, you know, potentially, you know, could be fatal, both in terms of the immediate um, support people get and then the ongoing, mm -hmm. you know, treatment. Um, what about now? If somebody's <clears throat> in their 50s or whatever, has a heart attack, what's the chances of their life going forward? Yeah, I mean, most people now get treated in an excellent manner. I mean, that's, if you get to a hospital and you're having a heart attack, the standard treatment is to go straight to the cath lab, to go into the hospital, into the minimally invasive operating theatre, and the cardiologist will take a direct look at the heart artery using an X-ray dye picture. And if there is a blockage, that can be opened there and then straight away. So in Bart's, for example, uh, when that happens, if people are otherwise well and they've got, you know, they, they've managed to get in there quickly and open the artery, people are going home the next day and actually having some follow-up over the on the, the, the telephone the days and weeks afterwards. So really it's gone from being something which is was a catastrophic yeah. uh, event in the early part of my medical career where people would routinely spend a week or more in a hospital. Now people are going home pretty well the next day with medical treatment as mm. after they've had their artery opened mm. with a stent. And maybe the event itself will make them think, actually, do you know what? There are some adjustments I can make to my life and, you know, being more diligent maybe about the, the medicines or whatever the, the prescription is following. Yeah, for sure. And one also has to remember a large number of those heart attacks, people don't know there's anything wrong with them. You know, so this is the first time they come to medical attention yeah. and they end up going home with a bunch of medicines and obviously it's a huge shock, uh, but those medicines are there for their you know, direct benefit and sure as sure can be that people, uh, you know, do change their lifestyle. And, you know, one thing that's really, I just want to say one thing about that change in lifestyle, people really worry about doing exercise after something along those lines. People think that, well, but all the evidence really is that actually early getting back to activity, exercise activity, is a good thing. I mean, every study, literally every study that's looked at outcomes shows that exercise improves outcomes and longevity. So mm. uh, it's really clear that the cardiac rehabilitation side of things, getting people back to controlled exercise is a super helpful mm. addition. And that's something that's offered widely around the UK. Mm. Mm. Well, it's interesting because I had a uh, back operation back in 2005 mm -hmm. um, with a prolapse disc. And uh, the guy, the surgeon who operated, said that, you know, 25 years ago, the advice would be now go home, lay flat for two weeks, yeah. and then two weeks of readjustment back to work and so on. He said, I'm going to operate on you this afternoon at three o'clock, and tomorrow we're going to get out of bed. Yep. Saturday, you're going home. Mm -hmm. Sunday, you're going to walk three or four miles. Yeah. And Monday, you're going back to work. Yeah. I mean, exercise is you know? the best medicine, actually. Yeah. <laughs> exercise is the best so medicine. Shocking, but yeah. 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 Dr. Finlay, on the uh, desk there is a model of a heart. It's yep. a, it's sort of life size, I think. It's, yeah. This is, uh, oops, this is a, a small, uh, a smallish female, female heart. Um, uh, yeah. So, so why don't I just yeah, go through the, yeah, Take tell us how it works. Yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, this one comes. It's like rather easier to open up than a real, <laughs> than a, <laughs> than a, real a real beating one. I mean, the, the the way I normally think about the heart is just to go through the flow of the blood, and then to talk about how that how the heart's pumping is coordinated for that mm. for that flow. So actually, the blood comes into the right atrium here. This is the collecting chamber of the blood from the body and from the the head. Uh, it flows into the right ventricle um, through the tricuspid valve and then that pumps blood up to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. Um, blood then will come back through the pulmonary veins here at the back of the left atrium, the left side of the collecting chamber before going through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then pumping around the, uh, then, uh, pumping around the, um, the body. Um, 
the heart's pumping coordination is controlled by the electrical system. Mm. And uh, up here, it's not really, you know, it's kind of not obvious to see even in real life. But at the back of the right atrium, you have the sinus node. That's the heart's own pacemaker that sets mm. off the heart heartbeat once a second or so. And the electrical activity spreads passively uh, round the right atrium and then round the left atrium. But it can't get down to the main pumping chambers of the heart because you've got the valves and the fibrous valve rings in the way there. So it goes through a specialized conduction system, which runs just, you know, just next to the, uh, the aortic valve here, the main outflow tract valve of the heart. And that goes down a... Uh, a wire called the bundle of uh, the AV node and the bundle of Hiss. That's you know that's uh, the name of the Dutch anatomist, not his and hers, right? So mm. that then uh, the electrical system then activates the main pumping chambers, the ventricles together. And that causes the heartbeat to, mm. to 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 pump. So that's, that sounds actually quite complicated. Yeah, but I mean, there's uh, this is uh, something that's got to work every roughly every second. I mean, the most amazing thing is how amazingly reliable this system is i mean the vast this has to work every second throughout one's entire life 80 90 111 120 years however long mm. you're you're <laughs> however long one's aiming for and the longer the better and you mentioned the sinus node yep so my question is the the electrical componentry that makes it all work does that start in the brain or is the sinus node its own clever little yeah, so, I mean, the, microprocessor? The, the sinus node is has a bunch of specialized cells in it which have their own clock rhythm. So left on their own devices, they will go around 70, 70 to 80 beats per minute firing off an impulse. Now that speed of impulse is influenced by the brain. So it's the accelerator and brake on that and that's via the autonomic nervous system that's the you know the, the nervous system supplying the everyday uh, visceral reactions of the body so that fight or flight response the sympathetic mm -hmm. uh, response will speed up that yeah, it will speed up the sinus node as well as the rest of the electrical systems of the heart and the parasympathetic the converse the relaxation hormones will slow that down so it's quite common for people at night to run heartbeats of 45 beats a minute 40 beats per minute um, likewise, if you're an elite athlete, you'll be able to get your heart rate up to 180 beats per minute, um, mm. just through the the manifestation of those nervous system interactions. Mm. So, if you if you're going to start to do some exercise, mm -hmm. what's happening? You you start to do the exercise. A, a message arrives in your brain to say this person is going to need some more blood or whatever. Yeah, it's and really, your brain then what happens? It's really cool because the the conscious centers directly influence that even before you start doing exercise. So the anticipation ah. of needing extra, you know, extra blood flow, that happens before you're on the starting block. So that ah. upregulation, the sympathetic rate, the heart, the increase in heart rates and so on, it can kick in extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. If, for example, one's surprised and one suddenly needs a, needs to make a rapid exercise. But in the main, um, these things are the influences from the, Mm. from the conscious brain mm. uh, as well as the as, as well as the mm. feedback systems from demanding more more for exercise. so a thought a thought can start to increase your pulse yeah it can not just start to increase your pulse a thought definitely can and likewise thinking can lower your your pulse rate uh funny enough in my phd work we did some kind of cool experiments where we were looking at how pure mental stress and relaxation will influence not just the heart rate but the whole electrics of the heart and actually mm. how that that can change one's predisposition to abnormal heart rhythms and mm. we clearly showed that uh with under direct mental stress or thinking about a stressful event uh activating those systems does change the cardiac electrics and we were purely monitoring things we weren't mm. doing anything mm. the patient was lying mm. in the in the cath lab uh, whilst we were monitoring their heart electrics and we were just talking it was just mm. a pure mental exercise mm. that we were performing so proving 
that the uh, those connections are so very strong they can influence mm. the actual cellular uh, electrophysiology of the heart yeah that's very clever if that were a computer um that would make mistakes occasionally some of them would be <laughs> if it was your heart being yeah. ca- catastrophic so i remember in my middle years i might yeah. be i don't know late 40s 50 uh, i was quite fit i was climbing mm-hmm. some stairs mm-hmm. got to the top and was puffing and I thought, I shouldn't be puffing. I should be fit. So I forget who I spoke to. Uh, but the guy said to me, he said, no, I tell you exactly what's happening. You are super fit. Right. By by step number three, yes. your body's starting to get wound up. Right. It wants more oxygen. Your okay. heart is pumping more. Yep. So by the time you get to floor, you know, step yep. number 15, you are going. Okay. And that was why you started to puff. Yeah. So in fact, it's an indication that you were super fit, not not the other way around. Yeah, I mean, sense. one's own, that, yeah, that does make sense. There's also that whole thing that one's own indications uh, can be slight, you know, can be slightly off. You run up yeah. one flight of stairs and feel a bit short of breath because you weren't expecting that to be some exercise. Yeah, okay, so the heart, yes. you, know, you know, that's something that should be in every day. So you haven't made those adaptations. But, yeah. you know, fascinating. These, eh? minor, these minor perceptions, I mean, they're so complex, actually. Mm. They're so complex. And I think mm. that, yeah, we can ascribe certain scientific reasons to one aspect and another a- aspect, but often there are numerous different explanations that we mm. can co- come to. Well, we're going to look at some of the things that can go wrong. Yep. Some of them, you know, really bad, yep. some even fatal. Others troubling, but mm-hmm. not necessarily, you know, mm-hmm. more, more benign, um, uh, which we'll come on to. The other thing we'll come on to, um, Dr. Finley, if that's okay, you have you are something of a medical technology pioneer and there are two or three things you've been working on um, at least one has been actually released into sort of live mm-hmm. live practice um which i think people will find quite fascinating so um you know if you can we'll we'll pick those up a bit later on in our, in our conversation delighted yeah yeah let's do it <laughs> 